Radio Show with your host, Bonnie Clark. We stand together and accept that we now live in a world transformed by Fukushima. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time here on UCY.TV Radio. We relentlessly engage every ear that listens. We expose and confront the complete lack of accountability for the nuclear industry. Consider social engineering programs who view our bodies, minds, and souls as assets on a balance sheet. We discuss vital current issues, interview activists, and engage our audience in an effort to allow all voices to be heard. The Age of Vision Radio Show creates a venue that all will choose. We encourage our listeners to reclaim their power and their courage to take action and save our planet from the ravages of greed and indifference. Our actions matter. Every voice matters. We remind our listeners that happiness is resistance. Love is greater than fear. UCY.TV radio listeners. This is Lonnie Clark with the Age of Fission radio show. Thank you for joining us and thank you for caring enough about our planet to listen and to listen to people who are experiencing uh, the process of admitting, working through, and uh, living through the changes that we all have. In my intro, I say we now have to admit we live in a world transformed by Fukushima. I probably ought to have said we're transformed in a world transformed by the Manhattan Project. Today is Monday, and I have since found out that, since I found out that uh, St. Louis was an ignored catastrophe in our country, I have been interviewing activists and highlighting the plight of the victims of St. Louis. And today returning is Larry Bergen, one of the victims of St. Louis, who lives on the other side of the river. Uh, I'll let him tell his story. He was highlighted in the first secret city, the safe site of the fence, two outstanding uh, documentaries, which I've heard much about, but they're small and I am on the West Coast, have not seen them. So let me introduce you. Thank you, Larry, for joining us. Good morning, Lonnie. How are you doing? You know, I'm I'm doing all right, I guess, considering everything going on in my life. But uh, how are you today? Well, um, I can say we're doing, we're holding our own here. Um, a lot of people don't know about St. Louis's and the victims here in this community, and uh, I'm glad you're able to highlight this on your on your show, and because people need to know that there are victims all across this country, and due to what you just mentioned, the Manhattan Project, and again, something that was built to keep us safe is actually doing the opposite and uh, I am living proof of that or which is a weird way of putting it because because of my health issues and this radiation maybe I'm considered dying proof of it wow um, Larry wow you know, <laughs> and again this is why uh, shows like yours need to be out there so people can be aware of the health issues that arise from simple things you you cannot see simple like radiation and um, when I say simple I mean you know small amounts all over the place that you wouldn't even think of or recognize it could be in, laying in the driveway next to your mailbox you wouldn't know it it could be in your backyard or floating over your home and, and uh, then 10 15 years later you start getting sick and you oh, can't figure exactly. out why you're losing your strength you're getting these weird for the things that, mm -hmm. these are for the people out there who think they're safe wherever they're at relatively safe because they have no idea. No one's ever told them. There's a factory mm -hmm. next door. No one ever told them what they're producing down the street. So they well, where were you? What was your wonderful circumstances? Bliss. <laughs> Me? Uh, see, I retained my exposures from a factory producing it over here in Illinois. And, um, again, I lived What's in a What's the name of this city bubble. in Illinois? 
Oh, it's the uh, Madison, Illinois. It's right across the Mississippi River from St. Louis. In fact, you can see the Gateway Arch easily down the street mm. from the entrance of this factory. That's how close we are to it. And the idea that this um, factory upwind of this residence was built to produce aluminum magnesium was quite fine. There was no problem, they thought back then. Um, initially, the factory was built in World War II to assemble army tanks for the war project, which it did. But then in the 50s, it was sold off to uh, a Dow Chemical to produce magnesium and aluminum products. But the government still had its finger on the till because they um, gave this company uh, permission to process radioactive metals on behalf of the government. Mm. Now, of course, no one asked any of these residents living next door or this elementary school 20 feet away. No one ever uh, considered their issues or health. Um, again, the employees were even considered less uh, on that level because uh, we have no knowledge of any ID badges when he was working with any of these radioactive materials back then. They wasn't wearing any radiation badges or anything of that nature. Hey, Larry, do so, you mind if I interrupt you? I want to go back. Oh, no. to this. I want to understand this. So that factory was not specifically designed to process this radioactive material? No, no, ma'am. In fact, it, it, like been... said, it was built to assemble army tanks. So in a way, it was built to make death. And the problem with that is, after the war ended, producing all these radioactive materials, they continue producing that death, but in the form of victims as employees and residents. Wow. So they just turned a, a tank factory into a radioactive processing plant? A processing plant where yeah, they... That was, a buy, that was a side job for the company. It was an aluminum magnesium foundry, but on the side they would run radiologic materials for the government. For instance, they had At the same time. It wasn't like... That it, it wasn't... Would melt. Excuse me. What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. It, it was at it was at the concurrently at the same time. Like they were doing their normal business of creating these chemicals or whatever it is that they're doing, and then they had a side job of creating radioactive material for the government. No, no, it was Dow Chemical Factory, but there was never no chemical. It was nothing. It wasn't a chemical factory. All it did was melt aluminum into bars and rods. And, uh, and then they melted magnesium and into bars and rods as well. But because they had these unique processes, these giant pots, 10 feet round, over a dozen of them, they would also melt radioactive material for the government. Now, oh the ideal gosh. was... Yeah, it was thorium. Now, I watched them actually... Oh, too, my quit gosh. Year 2000. I watched them up to the year 2000 when they quit processing this metal. <sighs> But never once did they have any kind of duct work, any screens, any filters. All they had was exhaust fans in the roof, which would what? suck this radioactive smoke and dust out and then drift over downwind, which would land in the residents' yards and homes. It would land on their gardens and their food. It would land on their clothes hanging on the line, the children's playground, the elementary school 20 feet away, like I mentioned. Um, we had five teachers and a principal die of cancer from that school. Oh, my goodness. I am we had so... 75 people with cancer in two blocks next to this factory, but there's only 35 homes in those two blocks. What did your elected officials do? Nothing? I met with a congressman two weeks ago, me and our committee member, to uh, discuss this issue about finding help and uh, recourse for these residents. And they, she saw so much uh, damning material that she set up a second meeting with me and another congressman uh, on the 9th, next Friday, this Friday. So I'm meeting with two congressmen aides to discuss this issue to take it to the next level for um, testing, uh, an epidemiology study. Can you on the disclose rest who you are meeting with? Uh, congressman Shimkus, who is also uh, on a subcommittee for the environment and energy, and yes. Congressman Post, whose district these residents are in. Post? Post, B-O-A-S-T. Is he a new congressman? I know Congressman Shimkus. Yes, he Shimkus. is. Yes, he is. I'm pretty. This I... has helped us in the past. He actually sent a letter of recommendation for me being tested for radiation poisoning up in yeah. Rochester, New York, back in uh, 2007, I believe. 2008. That's why, in fact, you that that's in fact, wow. He sent a letter <laughs> of recommendation to have you tested. Yes. Yeah, see, I showed him. Uh, I was going to be tested up there at the Uranium Medical Research Center. It's it's based in Canada, but it has a New York office. And uh, 
what they do is they was testing soldiers coming back from the Gulf War who was around uranium dust or depleted uranium during the war and come back with uh, same sort of illnesses. Now, the thing is, every illness that they were testing for, you know, there's uh, specific uh, five illnesses that all these soldiers kept coming back with. Now, keep in mind, I had the exact same illnesses, and I, too, was exposed to uranium dust. Hmm. It take genius to start seeing the pattern here start to develop. That's a scientific So that's one of the reasons why they uh, chose me to be tested up there for the, at the Uranium Medical Research Center, because my illnesses were so closely related to these soldiers for the same reason. And, um, but the government canceled our test a week before I went up there for my testing. Of course they did. <laughs> they did it in the form of threats with funding. They told the university that if they tested any more people up there that they would pull their funding from the university. Of course and they did. And when it comes to money, college will do what they have to do. That's right. You know so, what's really um, sad about well, this? Told, well, they this told is... me the reasoning behind this was the government wasn't going to pay this university to prove that they've been poisoning people. And Why I'm not? How if they had integrity, if they had integrity, they ought to be saying, "Look, we didn't even know it was happening. We thought oh, they were better yet. Awesome. Play the hero card and say, "Hey, look what we just found! Oh my God! Please, everybody, rush here. We can help right. you. We want to test you." But they that's didn't. They wanted test. a hide it card, and that's it's always the ninety percent rule. Doctor John Goffman in the mid '60s had studied these the people from Hiroshima and Nagasaki for 20 years. At the end of that 20-year summation, he said, you know what I have discovered? The International Atomic Energy Agency, the military, most world governments. It, it goes across governmental lines. It is anybody oh, in the nuclear industry. I have proof right here in front of me on a piece of paper. Uh, the last attorneys we had to represent the residents sent us a letter saying, uh, we Please be advised that this office will no longer be taking further action on behalf to regard in this manner. Our potential research, our case shows that subject to the Price-Anderson Act, which requires right. proof of individual exposures, well, there you go right there. This letter from this attorney proves what you just said about the government's overreach and keeping this uh, a closed. It's the Price-Anderson Act. The Price-Anderson Act. Act. And even these attorneys knew what it was who never handled a radiation case before. You read a simple thing. Now, here's one other it thing these lawyers it. say, which I find extremely strange, unusual, is um, the residents themselves. The um, oh, I have a regret that our firm cannot. Have to. Okay, you and your community has been victims of the worst kind, and unfortunately, it appears the legal system will not be able to help you. Again, this probably refers back to the Price Anderson, which he mentioned. You know, yes, for, up in a paragraph. These people, just because they didn't work with the radioactive metal, they believe they aren't entitled to any type of compensation. Yet they're just as much victims as the, me and no, my No, it's not even that. It's because they're not going to make it. These attorneys didn't want it because they're not going to make any money. You know what the Price-Anderson Act does? Yes, it, it, keep, it keeps from suing the owners of the factory pr who's operating as radioactive material. It limits the amount of money that those people can have to pay. And then you know what happens with that? That's This is interesting because the government clean, pays for the cleanup, but then the licensees have to repay the government. That's where they're cutting the fuse wrap budgets. This is It's such a shakedown. It is, it is really unconscionable to think that this is really how our government operates. I mean, we are the farthest thing away from what our Constitution intended. It's I mean, what happened in the nuclear industry are the secrecy, the secret government, the nuclear priesthood. They call themselves nukies. They look at people with disdain. They called me and you nuke, mon nuke mongerers. You know what I mean? Like, it's, well, it's, it's a, it's a it's form invisible. of insanity. I believe it's the invisibility of the uh, uh, poison. I mean, you look right now, and you'll see they're all over the Zika virus. They're doing everything they can. That, well, as soon as Congress gets back from vacation, excuse me, they're going to Zika do everything they can to, to keep this Zika virus down. Now, Zika, you can't see it. It's invisible. It's a virus. But no, they're doing everything no. they can to keep it down. But the radiation. Look, now, this you is know why they're doing poison. it? They don't try to hide because why? Unlike the virus, this is profitable. 
radiation. Well, they lie, they lie about it. See, this is the thing. They deny radiation causes harm, underreport the negative effects by 90%. That's what Dr. John Goffman oh, yes. said. They are sticking with it. And the Zika virus is a way to avert the attention away from uranium poisoning. Every place where these babies have had microencephaly, they are downwind of grotesque uranium mining practices or a... Oh, yes, yes. There's that movie he was talking about several months ago about the uh, uranium mines down in South America. Yes, and it is just bull. This whole thing about Zika this, Zika that, I'm not buying it, but this is what I want you to discuss. Oh, it can be real, but I, it, I you love can't your take your eye off the other ball either, and that's the uh, radiation exposures. You're right. Just because this, a new illness comes around, you don't ignore the, the last one. <laughs> I want you to exactly talk the... about what you said to me about the victims. Please discuss oh, yeah. what you meant when you said you wanted to really talk about what the victims have to go through just to find out that they have been exposed. Tell, talk a little bit about how you understand that story. Well, you know, from, from my perspective, I was just an average Joe at work every day, punching a time clock, going home, getting dinner, eating, watching TV, and that. Then when I started getting ill, started having health issues, uh, my insurance was through my company. So whenever I had these weird health issues, I'd have to turn my medical insurance into my company so they would pay the bills. And then about six months after all my strange illnesses started uh, manipulating or started acquiring on me and, and building, uh, the company got rid of me and every other employee in the factory. They put us out on a strike a contract that no one in their right mind would sign to, to get rid of us. It took me a year after that to learn to walk again. I was literally bedridden for months and months. And my wife actually had to feed me. I couldn't even use my hands. And once I started getting what better... What happened when you just woke up weak? Oh, it was, that's, it was months. It took, me, it took me a year again to learn to walk. And that's when I finally wanted to look into my health issues, why I was sick. And that's when the radiation over my head, the radioactive dust, popped up on the on my radar. You know, how it was there, could that be to cause my illness? And uh, once I started looking into it deeper and the research, then I seen my coworkers were developing the same health problems. And then our, in our family, we were starting to have birth defects, something that never happened before. And then my coworkers, the same thing, birth defects and health problems. And uh, it was starting to be more and more obvious as we went as I looked into this. and Did you know a, it was radioactive dust when you were at work? Did anybody say, hey, Well, here's careful. the thing. They didn't tell us until the year 2000 when they came in to clean it up. What? See, <laughs> yeah, see, they was taking tests for the past six, eight years of the soil, of the uranium samples overhead. But they do it on a weekend when we wasn't there. And, of course, the owners knew they was doing this because the government didn't sneak in there like ninjas, you know. <laughs> they had to have permission, and they had to explain why. And um, the thing is, you know, the company knew we, this, I was being, and my coworkers on this one machine was being exposed to this dust on the beam overhead, uranium dust. And they also knew what our health issues was because of our insurance. So once they saw my weird illnesses coming up and that where I, location where I worked, I honestly believe they was easy to put one and one together and figure out, you know, this guy's going to figure it out, and then we're going to be sued. So what they did was got all rid of all of us, filed bankruptcy, and hope we went our separate ways and die off. Hmm. Sad. But. And what about the neighbors in your neighborhood? Did any of them know that they had been exposed after they oh, found oh, out? Oh, no, no, no. They wasn't even an afterthought. I mean, after you guys found out in 2000, when all that came out in 2000, did they tell the community, hey, you need to start, you know, this might have affected your families? You would think <laughs> they would, but I actually have a letter from the uh, Department of uh, Nuclear Safety, and it states that the employees, here it is right here, Illinois Department of Nuclear Safety comments on first sap to February 25th, year 2000. Army Corps has inadequately assessed the dose to the first critical group workers and entirely ignored the second critical group residents. Inadequate assessment is what it's titled under. Did they get Inad a second assessment from the Army Corps of Engineers? There was no follow-up. 
And why not? Because it was not their job to do a medical evaluation. Their job was to remediate. Oh, these people are unconscionable. <laughs> I know. It's like saying, well, we're here to take care of the body, but it's not my job to find out why he died. Right. <laughs> well, they're, they're thinking about ignoring babies and children and people that are weak. Well, that's sickness. just it. You know, the, the, they're the most successful, the young and the elderly, especially yeah. the young, because uh, the genetic uh, deformation and genetic uh, damage starts at a very early uh, age. I mm -hmm. mean, even that's why the miscarriages and birth defects is so much more prevalent. Now, me, I have some of what of a window being um, 30, 35, 40 when I was being exposed. So most of my genetic forms are already developed, but mm -hmm. it's the damaging since then, which will continue from here to the day I die. And you're but, a man, too. So men are stronger. Like, of all the species, that's why the government tests men. Did you know that? They, that's what made Dr. John Goffman study the Japanese. Yes, the government went in and took all this great information, and it started, it started to sum up pretty easy from the preliminary documentation. So they destroyed all the evidence after three years of all the women and children. Well, victims out there who, who know they are have nowhere to turn. There is no support group. And I think the key to... here is no, they are. I think a lot of people are really have been exposed to radiation and have no idea they have been exposed. Well, now, there are committees out there who are investigating this and working on, uh, like our committee, you know, on remediation and testing as such, but there is no, quote, like I said, support group. Someone you could call up and say, hey, uh, how do you know if there's radiation been in my neighborhood or this community? Or, hey, how do you know uh, with, what's the radiation exposure level due to a certain you know, There's no, like, a uh, someone you can go to. There is one new one that's out there called the uh, Cold War Patriot. They're, uh, they're actually a branch of the government, and that's really the only support group I've ever found <laughs> to help people. They're a branch I know, of the government? It's funny putting those two together, government support. Yeah, I know those. But uh, these are actually uh, a group who helps people sign up for the government cancer fund. And uh, they repeat the process as many times as necessary until they're approved. And uh, they give them as much information and, and answers as they have available to them. They're very good. Um, mm. um, these, it's, you know, you got to say they're good. They're the only ones there is. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> <laughs> and at least they help people get treatment. I mean, don't you think right. that is Right, they steer them in the right direction for getting them help. And our factory has already paid out over 100, uh, to 188 employees $28 million. Now, this is cancers caused by radiation through this NIOSH Cancer Fund. It's called the Energy Employees Occupational Illness Compensation Program Act. You no, know, just the it's nuclear the exposure alone entitles everybody in this country to free. Oh, it healthcare. took me years to help get this fund installed. In I mean, factory. we we ought to just have health care as a as a civil right. Like we ought to be able to go to the doctor and say, "Hey," and have the doctor without any limitations really figure out what's wrong with us instead of having to play games. I mean, we our doctors are so minimally education. We had that same discussion. You know, if the Republicans would have put much time and effort into improving Obamacare to where it's called America Care, they would be heroes. But they Look, wasted it, all that effort in trying to discredit it. It's, you know, you know what, Larry? I'm going to go deeper than that. Forget the Republicans. If the president would have had some gonads and given a single payer health care for all, we had the whole, the whole, the whole thing was already set up. We have Medicare, and we had the legislation. We Which had I the rely system on. set up. It's a great system. Obama sold us out and we are now suffering at the hands of republicans because he is a republicrat there is well, one party in this now soviet united states we live in the united soviet states of america where only the vote for the right candidate counts and where you don't have any rights we don't have the right to go to the doctor we don't have the right to vote we do not have the right to free clean food 
I mean, think about it. Americans are going to get a wake up call very shortly after this election because the axis. When Fukushima blew up, the state of Illinois uh, told all their citizens they were putting monitors around the state to monitor for radiation in the air to keep us safe. Yet, for years, our committee could not get them, the state, to come down and check these residents out, who we found uranium in their yards. We've had their yards tested. Oh, my God. Can you see the irony in this? They're more worried about radiation 6,000 miles away than here in their residence yard in their own state. When it's being And why is this? Most of these residents are poor and black. I believe it's more of a um, civil rights issue as well as anything else. Wow. Ain't this amazing? Ain't this amazing? Well, we're just like their little lab rats. That's the issue is this is. So what is this? What's the status of what you're doing, Larry? Because you got exposed at the factory. You've Mm -hmm. been, you discovered that you had this litany of illnesses of which you've been struggling and managing and dealing with issues in your family. What type of litigation, where, where, where are you legally? Are you suing Dow or are you looking, what are you looking for? What's your compensation that you, what's your remedy? Again, now? the good to come from this bad. We cannot go back and change what has happened. So I work to find the good to go forward. And, uh, of course, one of the things is helping the residents and the employees. Uh, when I found out something very important when I first started investigating this was I'm not alone and to ignore others who have been poisoned by the factory would make me as bad as the owner who ignored me and did this to me, and I could not become that type of evil. So I've been working to help everyone. I can't save the world, can't save this entire state or the city, but these six blocks, it's doable. I can do that, and that's what I've been working on for the past, uh, since 2003 when I first found out about this. Wow. uh, 13 years. Yes, ma'am. And uh, now, uh, again, I mentioned earlier how we have gotten over $28 million for 180 families through the cancer fund, the federal cancer fund. Um, again, I was, I'm was i very uh, uh, proud of what I've done to help make that possible. I believe I was the sole one to be included for the residual period. This Our factory was the very first factory to be included for a residual period up to 2000, uh, oh no, excuse me, 1998. Now, um, this is very unique because no other factory has ever been given residual compensation except ours. And I believe all the affidavits and all my uh, presence and pre- presentations to the board members proved to it it was real and they saw it. So I'm proud of that fact. And Congratulations. That, and that helps great. us on the federal level. Now, the state level... But it also sets purpose. precedent, too. It yes, pres- that's what I it had to do. It sets precedent for them there. to have to acknowledge it. Absolutely. Because once they know it's there and it's harming us, you can go where you want from here, and that's where I took it to the next level. I filed a workers' comp claim. Now, even though I haven't worked there for seven, eight years, the um, statute of limitation in Illinois states that you're only uh, eligible from time of injury for three years, and that's everything, mercury, lead, arsenic, no matter what, except one thing, radiation. Statute of limitation is 25 years. Now, why is it so much longer than all the other statutes? Because it takes that long for this insidious poison to rear its ugly head and cause its damage to the body. So, having this knowledge on hand, I went, filed a workers' comp claim, and within a week, my lawyer told me the insurance company has conceded on this claim with all the documentation I provided him. Mm. And uh, immediately, I knew then, I had a second window of opportunity for the employees and since then, I signed up over 150 employees with health problems associated or connected to this radiation. So we have a cancer fund for cancers through the federal government, and I'm, and I'm hoping soon, within the next several months, if not weeks, we'll have the door op- window open for the uh, illnesses acquired by it as well on the state level. Now, that will give us two uh, windows of hope for the employees and victims inside this factory. Now, it's on the other side of the chain link fence where the residents were exposed, we're still dealing with. Now, I told you just a few moments ago, I read from a letter where the last attorney let us go because of the Price-Anderson Act. That's why now we're turning to the political process. We're going to stop going after the legal uh, option and try to go after the political. Because um, What do you mean by that? What are you talking about? Well, for years, our committee, since 2009, since we formed it, we've been trying to find lawyers who can help these residents 
to uh, associate their problems and their health problems to their exposures and mm-hmm. to uh, get them compensation. We watched over at Westlake Landfill over in Missouri. Them, for years, they've been going through politicians trying to get help and going nowhere. So our committee thought it would be a good idea to go a different direction, to go through the uh, legal process of trying to get these residents help and recognition. And since that seems to have expired, now we're turning back to the political uh, option. But the good news is we have a lot more information than they do at Westlake Landfill. Um, these lawyers over the years that been, you know, that would take our case and let us go, take our case, let us go, <coughs> they weren't denying us uh, or rejecting us. They were helping us build our case. You see, the first lawyer says, well, you've got a good case, you just don't have this. So our committee would work for months and get that information, go to a new lawyer. <laughs> he would say, well, you got a good case and you got this, you just don't have you know, that. So our committee would work months and get that information, and we'd go to another lawyer. He would say, oh, well, you got man. this and that, you just need the other, and then so on and so on and so on. But the thing was, they weren't rejecting us. They helped us build our case step by step by step by they step. They told so you we, what you were lawyer, technically We have missing. everything they need. It was, it's like a hidden miracle. <laughs> so when these politicians seen this last week or two weeks ago, they were just overwhelmed with the cancer list, with the uh, radiation, the uranium levels. Congressman level Shimkus' yard. office, you mean Congressman yes, Shimkus? Yes, yes. They were wrong. like, oh, my fact, gosh, uh, they cannot ignore this, yes. Oh, absolutely not. But see, before, all we had was one off-site uh, exposure, and it was only five feet down next to the roadway. It, you know, it, it was oozing off the waste site. But that didn't seem to be enough. That's why we needed testing in their yards. Wow. And um, once we've got the radiation readings back, it showed elevated levels. You could actually read the levels of U-235. Which is what was in that to. facility. Well, see, I, here's this other thing I did was I made a bar graph of the reading of four samples in the residence yards, and I made four bar graph samples from the uranium readings inside when they removed it back in 2000. And what I did was I enlarged the bar graph readings to size in the residence yards because, you know, naturally they'd be much lower readings than inside. Inside is where they produced it. It just drifted out the window. So I enlarged the residence bar graph to size of the indoor, and they were identical. And when I mean identical, I mean identical. So right there I sent this finding off to a um, physicist. Explain that it, again, that you increased the bar graph. Well, yeah, I enlarged the size to scale. Okay, see, the, the readings are much smaller outside, uh, of course, naturally, because it was drifted over and landed in their yards. So what I did was I made the bar as, you know, it was like 1.0 outside, but the uh, bar graph inside would be like uh, 23.0. So I, what I did was I just enlarged the pictures to scale so it would match the ones Oh, I see. Door. And that gave us a radiological signature. That yes, told us the radiation, the uranium in their yards, the U-234, U-235, and U-238, is the exact same type of uranium inside the factory. And the radium that was processed inside the factory is a Belgium Congo ore pitch blend. So you tell me how Belgium Congo uranium got in these residence yards. Wow. I, I sent this finding to a physicist, and he agreed with my theory, saying it was the only way. There's no way you can have that higher uranium-235 readings naturally in uh, wow. this continent. Wow. So then now, what is going to be your net result? What are you guys going to gain when you say in just a few weeks? What's your process? Oh, Where are you in uh, well, hope getting... to uh, finalize our worker comp claims to start them. Uh, we're uh, right on the edge of uh, the analytical data is almost done. In fact, one of them already is. We have uh, certain benchmarks we had to reach first. So and, since you uh, got sick, you have not been on workers' compensation. They've been denying oh, you no, workers' no. compensation. Oh, no, no. We've been on Social Security disability. Uh, my wife also. She's a retired Sunday school teacher, and um, she. I brought this dust home. It affected her and my children as well and grandchildren. Oh um, so she also. We were living at the poverty level for the last 12 years, and I'm fighting these billion-dollar giants. It's truly so, a David, modern day David versus Goliath story here. But yes, right is. is on my side as yes. it was on David's. Well, and let's, you know, this is the thing that we're going to find out. Like, the sad part about going through these elected officials is that they are going to get pressure from within the military to not participate in remediation. Like, that this was is another the thing. Issue, yeah. 
That is, it is controlled by the military. There is no freedom. Like, these people have got to click their heels and say Sig Heil and do what they are expected to do. This is why the, the, the people of St. Louis are getting the big runaround. They're doing everything perfectly correct. I was one I of them. Mean, I, can, I agree. I was one of them. I was one of those drones who did what he was told in that factory. We're looking out for your safety. Don't you worry about it. And I left it up to them, and look what happened. 10 years, 12 years of poverty and pain. Well, um, not only that, look what it's done to the quality of your life. And and frankly, look what the secrecy and the lies has done to the fundamentals of our democracy. I mean, we live in a country now where people are shot in the streets by police officers. In a country where right now, if the government wants to come into my house, they have the legal right to sneak and peek. I they, live that's miles here from Patriot Ferguson, and everybody knows Ferguson was almost the uh, starting point for all this. Over here wow. in St. Louis? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, for us, you see, my perspective from St. Louis is, my opinion is, is I, I have this kind of subversive feeling that, like, they incited a lot of what went down in St. Louis to keep people from paying attention, because just about the same time St. Louis was about to break on a national scale, the radiation and the catastrophe that was going on, hmm, mm-hmm. that whole thing with Michael Brown happened, and it turned in, and there were people in St. Louis, there were advocates, so... I, this is what is beyond my comprehension here, Larry. Go ahead. We have these civil rights leaders going to St. Louis, acting like they care about people, ignoring the fact that there's a burning nuclear dump site yes. at the airport. Yes. Actually, you it, know, it hasn't reached a radioactive waste yet. It's still a fuse, burn, you know, getting ready to get to a time bomb, so to speak, nuclear well, time it, bomb. It is. I believe it is burning the radioactive waste. I really, be- I don't. I believe they're lying about that, and I think that's why they know they can't. Well, move some it. citizens are monitoring it a lot more closer than they had in the past. I'm sure if there was an inkling of anything leaking, uh, we would know of it. But again, these residents over at Westlake Landfill you're speaking of are lucky ones, and the reason I say that is uh, a lot of these victims live mile from the source, and this waste is under a tons of dirt. We're over here in Venice in Madison. They dumped it on top of the ground and piled it up as a two-story house and over a football field long and left it for decades. The residents said this radioactive waste is piled up. It looked like a sand dune when the wind would blow. Uh, See, so yeah, these wait, victims wait, wait, over here in Westlake wait. Landfill had the luxury of it being covered up. And Yours was here. not even covered up. They just No, I have it. photographs of it. It shows it above ground. They, even had a, they never put a warning sign. Now, this is another thing. Over at Westlake Landfill, they have danger, radiation, keep out, and on all the fences. Over here, they never had one sign ever, not even a keep out or a private property, never. And the fence was only four feet tall with large sections missing. That's all they had for decades. It wasn't until they removed it in 1993 that they actually put a 10-foot fence up. But still, no signs. Again, no they don't warning. want the residents to know. If you would put a danger radiation sign up... How did they move the it? They had trucks come in through the factory gate and didn't work around, so the residents never saw them. They uh-huh. said they did that to keep from imposing an uh, inconvenience to the neighborhood. But actually, now, when, it was out of sight, out of mind is what it was. When They, when they removed they over 106,000 tons in one radiation cleanup in that lot next to their homes. 106,000 tons equal 212 million pounds of radioactive waste. 200, there was 235 million people in the country back in 1992. That's one pound of radioactive waste for every man, woman, and child in the United States was dumped on this lot above ground and ignored for decades. Now, that's perspective. It took a 1,000 rail cars to remove it in three years. And that was just one radiation cleanup. I got three of them, that we, four of them documented. Who handled the cleanup? It was an outside company called Environmental Restoration Group, ERG. I called up there and spoke with the uh, site manager. Did they, kept, do a, more, did, they, did they do a clean, sane 
way of removing it? I mean, you say they put these on rails, but did, was it protected through the rail? I mean, like, did they have, yeah, like, uranium dose posting, you know, puffing down the train tracks? I mean, I have this idea that they were just, it sounds like it's just been When it's a private company, you're never sure of that. Because, remember, you're paying a lot of money to do a job. Last thing you want to do is tell our customer, well, you know, it's going to cost you more. So it's always questionable when a private outside company does this. And one of the questions is, in, in the documents I received during this cleanup, it said that they had air monitors stationed all around this, this lot that they, when they was removing this radioactive soil, and that the uh, monitors would go off occasionally when it would go over the limit. But there was nothing in these documents where they said they warned the residents, again, not to eat their vegetables or close their windows. You know, they never warned anyone. So in some form, I make them culpable in some in that manner for not raising a red flag. And again, when it was removing this radioactive waste, they only went as far as the road and stopped. Now, they went five feet down, but they didn't dig underneath the road or dig a roadway up or go under the road. They was only paid to clean up that lot and nothing else. And once they got to the edge of it, that's where they stopped. They ignored the rest of the radiation underneath the road, which led to the residents' homes. Remember, they only live six, eight feet away from this nuclear wall. Larry, lot. have you had the opportunity to talk to any of the executives for any of these corporations or at the DOE and ask them how in their possible hearts they could possibly just ignore the harm to human health and just That's not That's happening now, ask. dear. You see, we couldn't in the past because of the legal aspects. We didn't want to be say something or... Uh, put something out there that could come back to bite us in the ass, so to speak, you know, when it comes to a lawsuit. Uh, we didn't want to uh, overstep yeah. our bounds, and yeah. we always want to stay within the legal means. But now that that window has passed, now we're free to say what we know. And at Very length. shortly you'll be able to go and ask them these questions. Cause that, yes, well, I'm sure the congressman will if we don't. I hope he does, and maybe that's what you should tell the congressman. Well, timing is everything when it comes to politicians. And right now, because of Flint, Michigan, here's the good to come from the bad there. Right now, because of Flint, a lot of government officials and agencies across the state are on pins and needles, hoping that does not happen to them. They know of health issues that they've been putting off because they didn't seem to warrant concern. But now, seeing what happened in Flint, Michigan... They don't want to come back and bite them in the ass. So when someone has a health issue now that affects a large community, they have to pay attention. And that's what's happening now up here in Missouri. Now let me explain. Now this machine that I told you about, I worked on all these years, that processed all the uranium, over 3,200,000 pounds of uranium it processed. I found the back half of this machine in 2005 sitting on a banded road 50 feet past the county line over here in Illinois. I couldn't believe it. I called the... Uh, um, Say that uh, again. I found the back half of this machine that processed all the uranium in our factory sitting on a back road back in November in 2005. Mm -hmm. I had a, a Senator Obama's aide out there. I had Channel 5 News out there with a camera. I had three lawyers out there. Wow. And, and to look this press over. And we went back to the... And afterwards, they went back and asked the owner why it was out there. And he wouldn't give them a, a correct, you know, a straight answer. Now, 10 years later, about seven months ago, I believe I found the front half of this press, the most radioactive part, the part that the uranium was actually pushed through. And believe it or not, it's buried in a field in secret down in southern Missouri. No way. I swear. We found out that back in 2005, when after they got rid of all its employees and changed its name, the owner hired this guy in who... They, uh, the other co-worker said it was a, was a very reliable person. He was always drinking on the job and such. But the owner didn't care because this job guy had only one job and one job only, and that was to cut up the front half of this press, to cut it up in little pieces. And he told him to take it to his farm and bury it. And that's what he told the co-workers out there he was doing with it as well. He, so I'm taking it to his farm and burying it. Now, um, you know, I didn't think anything about this or know any of this, until I found out that the the reason that press, the back half of that press was sitting on the side of the road, was the guy who was cutting up this press, his nickname was Scrapper, he was trying to take the back half to a scrapyard. It being the back of the press, making it least radioactive, he thought he may be able to get it through the scrapyard's detectors. But he got pulled over and written a ticket for hauling unsafe 
explode. And on that ticket, it had his name and address, which was Southern Missouri. So that traffic ticket, me and the, uh, at the EPA office, we was looking it over, was actually a treasure map which led us to the radioactive gold. So the guy at the EPA office looked up on MapQuest, this property, went back to 2005, and, he's, and his words was, there's a disturbance in the soil. So wow. I've been working with the Department of Natural Resources over in Missouri and a private investigator who works for them to look for such anomalies like this. And uh, we've been working with them. I gave them the phone number of two of the employees who witnessed this gentleman uh, cut it up and load it and haul it away. And uh, we're hoping they get a search warrant soon to go on that property. And if they find it, they can remove it. And then, this is my hope, that they can go after the owner of this factory for willfully and knowingly taking radioactive, well, smuggling radioactive material out of a government-licensed facility. His factory is a defense contractor, by the way and sneaking across state lines and burying it in secret. If I could have him charged and convicted of a felony, I could have no, all the government it's contracts it's the Price-Anderson Act. He will not be convicted of anything. It's the Price-Anderson Act. Knowing well, we're not it's but knowingly or unknowingly causing harm. Knowingly ah, or here's unknowingly. The, here's the, yeah, here's the chink in the armor. That was SCI. Now, this is the same owner, but he's, that, you know, he's remember, changed the name to a different factory. That makes that factory responsible, and that factory has no radiation licensing whatsoever. And so besides that, that, let me ask you this. employees commit a crime. See? Now, you know he can't what, be covered then? in price actors in that because his factory isn't covered anymore. It was the old factory he had had to license. <laughs> That's true. This was all unlicensed. Right. See, remember, and when he got rid of us, he changed them for a but new why, name. Let me ask you this. Why is it that the government didn't make sure that that radioactive machinery was properly disposed? Isn't it our Department of Energy? They lost track or, or ignored it for years. I mean, they wouldn't even cleaned our factory in the year 2000 if it wasn't for K. Dry doing a newspaper story about it. And if it wasn't for that newspaper story, uh, it'd still be raining down on us today, and we'd probably still be working under it. Uh, well... The new group would be. We'd be too ill. What do you mean? But Say that it, again. Kay Dry ran a quick story on... Oh, the... she, yeah. She helped write a story back in uh, 1989 exposing this factory uh, processing uranium. Now, I never read that. I wish I would have back then. I would have had a heads up. But it was in the uh, local newspaper. And it told of uh, a, a truck driver by the name of Tom Green who would deliver uranium billets to our factory. When she interviewed him, he was laying in a hospital dying of double lung uh, cancer, which was probably contributed to his exposures. Hmm. So that's how I found out first, you know, the uh, where it came from and how was through her and through her story. And Miss Dry is a wonderful, wonderful woman. For the last 40, 45 years of her life, she's dedicated to uh, finding radioactive waste sites and factories and production here in the St. Louis area and help for people. And she is truly, truly... Uh, uh, a hero in my book. Yeah, too. yeah, she is. Yeah. She's. I've interviewed her twice on the radio show. She's really uh, done tremendous work, and her. You know, she. Her whole focus was civil rights when she got out of college. That's what she was working for was civil rights, mm -hmm. and in a way, this kind of makes sense that she would dedicate her life to this because this is our civil rights. Well, like Mr. This Green was a black man, and us. I believe that's why they got took advantage of him because of that. And he was the one who delivered all the uranium billets to his factory year, you know, month after month after month wow. for years. And wow. again, running it through that factory, making that smoke and steam and heat, it would go up to the roof, and there it would go out the windows and drift over and land in the resident yard. Larry, let me ask you this, because you might understand where to look for this. Uh, your story makes reminds me that most of us have no idea how close we live to a nuclear facility or any type of radiological material being produced. Many of us can see chemical factories, but how would a person find out? Do you, I mean, in your case, how do, you know it was only because of that story that you found out. I mean, how does a person find out? Like, this is the thing. People in their neighborhoods just don't know. People I'm don't sure know. I'm sure there's a map or a, a, a online where you can go and see different production spots throughout the country and, uh, you know, at different Look levels. Look at those little towns. Maybe that's what I'll do is I'll connect all those right. stuff. Well, here's a, here's a, for instance, 
I was at a funeral of a family friend down in Crystal City, Missouri. It's down southern St. Louis. It's below St. Louis, about 20, 30 miles. And while I was there, when I ran to aunts and uncles and cousins I haven't seen in years, and one of them was a cousin, Linda, of mine. And uh, when I told her about my you know, radiation exposures and health problems, she told me, oh, yeah, uh, my family was poisoned. I lost my, grand- my child because of radiation. And I go, well, what do you mean? And she, when she told me, well, we live down in Hematite, Missouri, well, as soon as she mentioned the word Hematite, I already knew her fate. See, down there they had a small building, not a factory, but a building that processed plutonium. Oh, and uh, I remember years earlier reading a newspaper article where this lady, Clar- uh, Clarissa Eastman, was uh, trying to get help for everyone living around this factory. Uh, they found elevated levels in their yards, and their, um, they had health problems through their community. And um, she, you know, when she told me the story, you know, that where she lived, I knew she was one of the victims that was living down there with Miss Easton. So, um, you know, as I was there to grieve for one of my family members, I was also feeling sadness and remorse for my cousin as well. Here's, yeah. And the thing is, you know, we haven't seen each other in decades, and we live almost 100 miles apart in two sides of the, in two different states, yet here we are, both our lives ruined by radiation. Yeah, yeah, you that know, is... It's, it's and completely unconnected, yet, again, it shows you the proliferation, how much and where it can be. Yeah. Well, it's also amazing. the denial. My this co-worker, is the thing. Oh, oh, another one. My co-worker worked with me under this uranium for years, and when they shut our factory down, he started working over in St. Louis at another building. Well, they shut that down a few years later, and he went back to look it over, and he noticed he was having a radiation cleanup. So he told me about it, and I looked it up, and it was over on uh, uh, Lafayette Avenue. Well, it turns out that they stored and processed uranium there as well. So here's my friend who worked with me at this factory. He was poisoned in uranium, by uranium in two different factories in two different states. Wow. He had heart uh, surgery at age 39. Oh my goodness! See, this is the thing—the denial. Be poisoned in two different factories in two different states, and not even knowing it. Well, this is the. His this wife is died my at age forty-three. It's the denial of our government. Like, instead of having some integrity and being honest, they have thwarted science entirely. They have disregarded human life and all life on our planet to have military power and might. That's really it. And when they say, even if they want to have energy, okay, it's all about. It's it's so, to be honest, it is unconscionable. It is, I do not know how they can live with them. Of the people who are processing this. Again, if there was no profit to be made, we'd be safe. There is no profit to be made. They're taking oh. it from the government. That's all it is. It's tax dollars paying for it. This is not an industry that is even insurable. It is uninsurable. Oh, that's true. In fact, Dow Chemical, who is processing this material, was sued by their own insurance company back in 1969 for over $10 million. And it's all been blacklisted out. You can't find out why. And we believe that they didn't disclose they was working with radioactive materials to their insurance carrier. And when they found out, they was up in arms because they knew that now they're going to be responsible for all these cancers. So what did they do? They sued the Dow Chemical and won. They won? Yes. Well, Dow Chemical paid them over $10 million to Aetna and found a new insurance carrier. Oh, after. my goodness. Oh, my now, goodness. Now, we don't know why, because all everything's been blacked out, page after page after page, like a government secret, you know, document. But it's really easy to figure out why. Larry, is there anything that any of our listeners can do to help support your cause? Or is there anything that anybody listening to us can do to maybe help sway our elected officials to take this more seriously? Maybe we should be calling these Congress people. And saying, you know, we want real, honest about evaluation of the radiological exposure. Well, I mean, what, what do we say? Fact, you have to, you know, concern is first and on the list, but you have to follow it up with knowledge and facts. Because if you come up to a congressman and say, you know, I think I'm worried about this, he's going to say, well, that'll be fine, and brush you off. But when you stick it in his face and say, look at these numbers, or look at these cancers in this neighborhood, or look at this factory, you know, what's produced, then that's a fact. And if he doesn't do anything then, then you go to a newspaper and you say, or a TV station, and say, look, this Congress knows about all these cancers. Why ain't he doing nothing? Why ain't he doing nothing about this radiation we found? Or what is he doing about this factory that's dirty? 
See, that's what you have to do sometimes to put some heat under the frog to get him to jump. Now, I did the same thing over here in Missouri. The DNR was uh, had a hard time finding uh, this press that was buried down in southern Missouri. They was dragging their feet. So what did I do? I called the FBI. And I told them, you know, we have tons of radioactive material missing. Instantly I had their attention. <laughs> and I told them about it being missing down in southern Missouri and how this how they haven't made it a priority in finding it. They're more worried about tires in a farmer's field. And uh, I told them that they should make this a priority, but given the fact that uh, anything could happen to anyone with this material. So what they did was they called me two days later and said that they're uh, looking into it. So I put the heat uh, on the uh, Department of Natural Resources in finding this press with using the FBI. So for a moment, it was not the Federal Bureau of Investigation. To me, there was a Federal Bureau of Intimidation. And what it did was get them moving. Uh -huh. This is things I do to apply pressure to, and the same way to help people. You have to be active. You have to have facts. You have to look. You know, people ain't going to give you answers. They don't know either. Yeah. Just like me. I, it took me 13 years to compile. A and the people who do, this is the interesting thing, and to be honest, I have a bit of bitterness about this one, because it is not our responsibility to do this. This is why no, we isn't. have governmental agencies, this is why we have the EPA, the Army Corps of Engineers, they ought not to have their hands tied behind their back to tell That's us true. the truth but and to help But remember, us. I left it up to someone else to look out for our safety at this factory, and they came back and it ruined our lives, so now... I ain't leaving it up to someone else. I am taking control. And that's what we all have to do as citizens, to keep these companies, the Thank government, you, so these materials at bay. We have yeah. to uh, realize this as a, as, a, as a group. And, again, do your research. Find that map you're talking about. Where is the closest radioactive place to you? Where is the wind, prevailing winds blow? Um, how about the cancer rate in the town next to it? These are things people need to... Look, I've done and all don't deny it. Like I have a family member who lives uh, near three nuclear power plants in Pennsylvania. She's like right in the middle of it, and it's like near. I think Three Mile Island. There's near two other nuclear power plants. She has four grandchildren with autism, and has really questioned me when I said, "Don't you think that might be related to living near a nuclear power plant?" Well, She's like, "No." You're right. She's lucky, though, in one aspect. She knows where it's at. Millions of us across this country don't know it's in our backyard, don't True. know it's laying in our mailbox, don't know it's down the street. So in one aspect, she's lucky she knows where it's at. These residents living next to a factory here in Venice, half, most of them still don't have a clue. Well, I would like to see us figure out a way to get our country back, to get our government back, to make these agencies work for us, and to get science back, because when scientists lie, people die. That's really the, and that's what we're living with now. It is an outrage that you have to become an expert. All of us are expected to like, this is, it, it, the scientific community has an obligation to have integrity. That's what I and I feel. have had a lot of people with uh, uh, physicists and help us down the road, doctors, and who are uh, looking back on a career of wanting to uh, repair, I believe, some of the damage they may have done in the past, or to atone for sins in the past, maybe, or yeah. uh, because there's a lot of uh, retired physicists who now are on the other side of the fence where they've been all their lives. Right, because they couldn't as the, when they were employed. See, oh, that's no, the either thing. a university or a government agency would prohibit them because of uh, uh, conflict Good of turn. interest. Well, uh, again, I have to go on, I've gone through many doctors and physicists over the years. I've learned yeah. this. Yeah. Again, yeah, I they're have coerced to. at every deep level. It's it's very it's very sad. Look, we are coming up on the end of the hour, Larry. I cannot believe this, but uh, thank you for joining us. I hope you will come back in maybe a month or so. I and update us on what's going on. So, I Larry sure Bergen, I... uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Lonnie. Okay. Well, put your courage feet on, people. Get Take action. Get educated. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you.